Director of Coaching and Training for the Southern Michigan Conference, and he is our friend, and would you please welcome Eric to bring the message this morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you. And, uh, you know, you guys don't, you probably don't all realize this, but it's not easy to come up here and give announcements. That's a lot of information that Sherry has to give you. And I remember when I first started out in ministry, like preaching, you'd get nervous enough, but the announcements would really make me nervous. Like you don't want to mess up the announcements. So Sherry does a great job around here. It's been good uh, being around and getting to know her a little bit. And good to be here with you on this balmy um, January day. I think it's going to get into the 20s, maybe, today. Um, I finally took my dog for a walk last night because I, I kind of have this 20-degree rule. If it's 20 degrees or below, I'm staying indoors. So my dog was just so thrilled last night. Um, but it is good to be here with you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open to Nehemiah chapter 2, and we'll get there in just a moment. Uh, so you all are in a series on the book of Nehemiah. And if you haven't been around, let me give you a little bit of a recap of the story. Uh, so the, the book of Nehemiah is about a guy named Nehemiah. That shouldn't come as a surprise. And Nehemiah was a Jewish man who's living in Persia. And he's there uh, during this time of exile under the Persian Empire. Uh, and, and during this time, he serves as a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Now, the job of a cupbearer was kind of a unique job. Um, cupbearers were considered, well, getting something here. Let's see. I'll switch where I have the pack. Maybe that'll help. Um, so cupbearers had this unique job uh, where they, they were considered high officials, high-ranking officials in, in the kingdom. But their job was mainly to pour and serve the drink for the king at a meal or a banquet. And in addition to that, they would also have to take a sip of it before serving it to the king to ensure that it wasn't poisoned first. Now think about having that job. I mean, if things go wrong just once, you're done, right? Uh, you're done. So it, it's a pretty intense job, pretty high pressure job. And also there is a certain amount of etiquette to this job. Um, if you were around the king, if you were in his presence, around his guests, uh, you had to have a positive demeanor. And in the midst of all of this, Nehemiah gets word from this remnant in Jerusalem that the city is in shambles, right? The city has been destroyed, it's been burned down, and specifically the wall, the, the Jerusalem wall had been destroyed. And the wall was this symbol of security and strength. And so he learns about this, and not surprisingly, he's deeply distraught. And the king picks up on this. The king can see that Nehemiah is sad, that something is wrong. And in most cases, if the king noticed that, the cupbearer would be in trouble. But this says something about Nehemiah. The king held him in high esteem. And so he asked Nehemiah what's wrong. And Nehemiah shares with him, I've learned that my city is in ruins, that the wall's been destroyed, and I need to go back there and rebuild it. <clears throat> and so the king not only grants him permission to do this, but gives him resources to do it as well. And so Nehemiah heads back to Jerusalem to begin this project where they would rebuild the walls and restore the city. And in much the same way, as we think about this idea of rebuilding and restoring, we just sang about it, perhaps there's something unique that God is wanting to rebuild and restore in your life. Uh, maybe there's something specific that God's calling you to in this season or in this new year. Maybe God's wanting to rebuild your faith. Maybe God's wanting to rebuild a relationship. Maybe he's calling you into greater obedience to him. And that's good. Those are all good things. But here's what we're going to look at this morning. If God calls you to something and you respond in obedience to the thing that God's called you to, you can expect adversity. You can expect obstacles. You can expect some opposition. And that's what we're going to look at in Nehemiah's story. Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem to begin this project, and not too long after, there's some opposition. And so in this story today, we're going to look and see what opposition he faces, how he responds to it, and how we might respond to the opposition in our lives today. So let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for the truth of the words uh, to the song that we just sang. 
that you rebuild, you restore all that's broken in our lives. And Lord, there's probably some who are in here today where this is a season of joy and uh, they're experiencing wholeness, they're experiencing delight in following you. And we celebrate that, we thank you for that. But there's probably some in here that when they stop and think there is some brokenness, there's some things in their lives that need to be rebuilt and restored. And Lord, wherever we're at in the midst of that, I pray that you would just meet us there. Lord, I pray that in these few moments, you would quiet our hearts. I pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive from you afresh and anew. I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint me to bring good news to your people today. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to switch mics here. Sherry was right. First service went off without a hitch. All right. I don't have to push anything. All right. Well, let me turn this other one off so you all aren't hearing me multiple times. All right. I went out. All right. I've got one muted, one on. Hopefully this is better. So um, if you have a Bible, turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. And I want to begin by looking at verses 18 and 19. So Nehemiah, he's back in Jerusalem, and he's assessed the state of the city, and he's inspected the walls, and he calls the people together, and he casts vision now for rebuilding the wall. And so the people are before him, and this is where we're going to pick up. Verse 18. So he says, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They, the people, replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat and Horonite and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? So they're about to start the project, and people have caught word of what's going on. And not everyone is happy. And so there's these three characters in particular that show up to express their opposition to Nehemiah and the project. And I like to call these guys the haters, right? The haters. Uh, You know what a hater is? A hater is someone who just, they're going to criticize whatever you do, right? They want to discourage you. They want to disparage you. They want to stop whatever it is that you're doing. They are intentionally committed to making sure that you don't accomplish what you want to. And that's who these three guys are. The first one that we're introduced to is a guy named Sanballat. And Sanballat was from Samaria, so a, po- a political enemy of the Jews just to the north. And he was considered a governor of the Samaritans at that time. Uh, then the second hater that we're introduced to is a guy named Tobiah. Tobiah the Ammonite. He was a high official, potentially a governor himself in Ammon. In Ammon. And what was unique about him is his family had intermarried with the Jews. And so he had this unique influence on the Jews as well. And then the third hater is Geshem the Arab. And in those days, Arabs were a people group that had become dominant in the Transjordan, especially in Israel, and they had special favor uh, with the Persian king. And Geshem is considered to be someone who was in charge of a powerful group of people uh, who occupied the northeastern part of Egypt, just south of Israel. And so these three haters show up, and we read that they mock and ridiculed the Israelites, right? They mock and ridicule Nehemiah, and they accuse him of rebelling against the king. Essentially, they're accusing him of treason. Now, why are these guys opposed to Nehemiah? Why are they opposed to the rebuilding of the wall? Well, if we were to go back a few verses, so Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, where we're first introduced to Sanballat and Tobiah, We read that they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites, right? So why are they opposing Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall? Because they saw the welfare of the Israelites as a threat to their own welfare, as a threat to their own power, to their own comfort, their own financial gain. Essentially, Nehemiah was bad for business, You see, what this shows us right off the bat is that God's kingdom is always a threat to earthly kingdoms, right? Because the Israelites are the people of God. And so if if they were 
going to restore the city and restore the wall, that was a threat to the surrounding kingdoms, the surrounding regions. The, God's kingdom is always a threat to earthly kingdoms. That was true the day of Nehemiah. It's true today. And so the opposition is building around him. And these leaders from neighboring regions are resolved to put a stop to this project. But Nehemiah is not to be deterred because he recognizes the importance of this project. This wasn't just a personal interest of his. He believed that God was calling him and the people to this. In fact, the verse we just read, verse 18, the people referred to this as a good work. So they began this good work. Later on in the book of Nehemiah, it's referred to as a great work. See, anything that God calls you to, any work that God calls you to, it's a good work. It's a great work. But I assure you, if God's called you to a great work, obstacles are on the way. Right? There will be great obstacles as well. And this is our big idea this morning. Right? That if God has called you to a great work, then you can expect great opposition. If God has called you to a great work, you can expect great opposition. Some of you are like, thank you, preacher. This is really good news. I'm really encouraged this morning. Here's how one theologian put it. He said, whenever you find someone, somebody who says, for the sake of God, let us arise and build, I guarantee you will always find someone who says, let us arise and destroy. Right? So the opposition here continues to grow. God's called them to a great work. Now they're facing great opposition and it's growing. So if you turn to chapter four, so Nehemiah chapter four, the haters show up again, right? So verses one through three, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Right? So Sanballat shows up again, and it says that he's angry, right? He's so angry, um, and he's greatly incensed. Now, the Hebrew phrase that's translated as became angry uh, means to become hot, or literally to have a hot nose, Right? So you've heard the phrase hot-headed. Sandballot was hot-nosed, which I think is like another level above headed. That's how angry he is. So he begins to hurl these insults, question after question. He asks these five questions that are all these insulting questions. And then Tobiah chimes in. Verse 3, Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Essentially, he's saying, look, even a light-footed fox, if he jumped on that flimsy wall, he would knock it over. So just insult after insult, right? Insult after insult. And Nehemiah and the people, they're hearing this. And how do they respond? I mean, what, what do they do in, in the midst of experiencing all this opposition? You, know, you have these insults. You have this accusation of treason. Right? How do they respond? Well, in the same way, when we face opposition, there's different kinds of opponents, different kinds of adversity. And so here we have the haters. And many of us, maybe if God's called us to something, we're going to experience haters as well. So people who they're intentionally trying to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. That's one, one kind of opposition. The second uh, is a group that they're not, like, they're not intentionally trying to stop you. But maybe they just, they tend to be a little negative, right? They just tend to be a little pessimistic. There used to be this Saturday Night Live sketch, Debbie Downer. Anyone ever see that? Um, so you'd have, you know, the sketch, there'd be a group of people, they're at a dinner party and they're all having fun and enjoying themselves and they're talking about whatever. And then Debbie Downer will just kind of say something negative out of, out of nowhere. And she just brings down morale around the table. Sometimes that happens. Like people, they're not, they're not out to get us. They're not out to stop us, but they just can't help but being negative. Sometimes they might even be well-meaning, right? Well-meaning, but they're, they're risk averse. Maybe they don't truly understand what God is up to and how God is, is calling you and leading you in your life. 
Uh, in 2008, my wife and I, we had been serving at a, a church in the Chicago area. I had been youth pastor there for several years. My wife had been worship pastor. Uh, we had pretty good staff roles in this church, but we believed in that season that God was calling us to start a new church, to go into church planting. And God's call was about as clear as it could be in that season. And so we decided to step down from our roles and to raise our own support uh, to start and lead a new church. And you might recall um, what was going on in our nation in 2008. That was a time that was known as the Great Recession. So we've received this call from God, and, and we're taking this step out in faith. And I remember thinking to myself, it's great to do this in the context of a church. Right? The church is just, they're going to rally around us. They're going to encourage us. Uh, they're going to be inspired by this. And I remember shortly after we announced what we were doing, several leaders in the church, it was like two or three conversations, one right after another, leaders in the church would pull me aside and say, hey, Eric, I mean, you're, you've got a wife and two young kids. Um, there's a, a big recession going on. Are you sure that this is what you're supposed to do? Um, I, I mean, are you sure that this is the best decision to make for your family in the season? I'm thinking to myself, thanks for the encouraging talk. Um, yeah, thanks for your support. They were well-meaning, right? They, they had my family's best interests in mind. They wanted good for us. But what they were saying could thwart what God was calling us to in that season. So sometimes the opposition we face is actually well-meaning. And, and we have to discern that. But then there's a third kind of opposition that each and every one of us face. Nehemiah had these guys who were accusing him of something. But we all face the great accuser. We face opposition from the ultimate enemy. Right? Later in the Bible, we're told that our battle, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but the principalities and powers of darkness. Right? If Jesus has called us to something and we say yes to that, the devil, Satan, the enemy is not going to be happy. And he's going to do whatever it takes to stop us dead in our tracks from following the mission that Jesus has given us. Author and pastor Mike Breen, he describes it this way. He says, the reality of the battle we are in is not something that scripture is ambiguous about. We are at war and you are going to get really hurt if you're not alert to the wiles of your enemy. He wants to see everything that you hold dear completely and utterly destroyed. He doesn't make truces. He doesn't have a soft spot in his heart. He wants to ravage your life and burn everything to the ground. He wants scorched earth. So God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. But Satan hates you. And he has a terrible plan for your life. And he will do whatever it takes to stop you from rebuilding or restoring whatever God is calling you to. So how do we respond? How do we respond when we face opposition? Well, I want us to look at the rest of our time at how Nehemiah responds to the opposition that he faces. And we're going to see that there's three ways that he responds. And I think there are three ways that can be really helpful for us when we're responding to opposition. And here's why this is important. Because the best time to decide how to face opposition is not when you're facing opposition. The best time to decide how you're going to face opposition is before you face the opposition. For example, any Lions fans in here? I think I saw a few Lions shirts. Come on, raise your hand. You should be excited. This is a big day for the Lions, right? This happens, what, once every 30-some years or so? Um, so your hope probably today is not that when the Lions get out on the field, they're like, all right, let's figure out how to beat this team. Let's come up with a game plan right now, right? I mean, the game would be over pretty quick then. You're probably hoping that they've spent some time thinking through how they're going to respond to the opposition today, right? How they're going to uh, match up with their opponent. They're, they've studied their, their strengths and their weaknesses and their tendencies. They're going to come prepared. They've thought about their opposition before they actually face the opposition. Well, how much more important? Is it that in our spiritual lives, we're prepared to face the opposition before we face the opposition? So let's look at how Nehemiah responds. First response is he prays. He prays. In verse 4, verse 4 begins, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. And so Nehemiah, he goes into prayer. And it's important to note, this wasn't an isolated response for Nehemiah. This tended to be the pattern. 
If you were to go back and read the beginning of the book of Nehemiah, when he first learns about the state of Jerusalem, his initial response was not to come up with a strategy. His initial response was not to figure out how to go back and to, to save the people and to rebuild the wall. His initial response, the text says, is he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. Right? He goes into prayer. That's his immediate default response. Oftentimes, when we face challenges and opposition in life, we try to solve the problem. We try to figure it out on our own. I know I do. I'm wired that way. I want to figure stuff out. I've got a problem. I'm going to Google it. I'm going to YouTube it. I'm going to figure out how to solve this thing. Right? And, and we do that. So we, we come up with a plan and we think our intelligence, our experience, our expertise, our money, our resources will take care of it. And then when they don't, we think, well, now I should pray. And we, I, I've heard, maybe you've even said this at times. Well, now all we can do is pray. You ever hear that or say that? All we can do now is pray. Basically, like, uh, we've exhausted everything else, so now let's try praying. Let me offer you some pastoral counsel this morning. All you can ever do is pray. All you can ever do. Prayer should not be our last resort. It should be our first strike. And that was true of Nehemiah. That's the first thing that he did, is he prayed. But notice what he prayed. Verses 4 and 5, we move on. So he says, hear us, Lord, for we are despised. And then he prays this. <clears throat> Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Can I just say, that's not a nice prayer, <laughs> right? I mean, essentially, he's saying, God, would you just destroy our enemies? Take them out. Don't forgive them for this. Don't show them any mercy. And I don't know about you. I read that prayer. It kind of makes me uncomfortable, <laughs> right? Like, is this, is God saying this is how we're supposed to pray? But stop and think for a moment. Everything that Nehemiah has experienced up until this point, right? So up until this point, he'd been living in exile in a foreign land. He returns home to see his city, completely burned, utterly destroyed, the wall in shambles and rubble. The people there are living in fear and poverty and affliction. And then they actually begin rebuilding the wall, but now they're facing opposition. Nothing is going right for them. And so if you think about it, you can understand why Nehemiah might feel this way. I mean, I think of today. How might someone in Ukraine or parts of Israel or parts of Gaza feel? Right? Their homes have been destroyed. Their families have been displaced. They don't know where they're going to find their next meal. They don't know where they're going to find clean drinking water. They're suffering from sickness and disease and wondering what's going to happen today. Right? Is my city or my town going to be bombed again today? I imagine some of them might be thinking, God, would you just take out our enemies? Would, might you just destroy them? And this prayer that Nehemiah prayed is what is often called an imprecatory prayer. It's a prayer of judgment. Um, actually, the book of Psalms is filled with imprecatory prayers. These psalms of judgment against our enemies. We don't often sing those on a Sunday morning. That'd, that'd be a little unique. Um, but we see it all throughout Scripture. Now, I'm not necessarily saying... Like, we should pray that God would destroy us. Some of you right now are thinking, you know what? I'm up for a promotion against this other person at my job, and I'm just going to pray that God destroys them. That's not what I'm saying, right? But here's what I think Nehemiah's prayer illustrates for us. It demonstrates that he's praying from his heart. He's praying from the depths of his heart. This prayer is a real, raw, honest, and authentic prayer. This is how he's feeling. This is how the people are feeling during this time. He's bringing his emotions to God. I, I think what the, this prayer shows us is that we can tell God anything. And God, he wants us to bring our emotions to him. He wants us to bring real, raw, unfiltered prayers to him. God wants us to tell him how we really feel. God's a big boy. Like He can handle us being honest with him about how we really feel. He's our father and he wants to hear how his children are really feeling. I was thinking about this earlier this week. I have three boys, and uh, one of my boys, one night after dinner, I'm sitting in the other room, and, and I can just, he's in his room, and I can tell that he's upset about something. 
There's just something that's really bothering him, but he hasn't told any of us what's going on. And so finally I walk into his room and I sit on his bed and I say, buddy, tell me what you're feeling, right? Because as his dad, I want to know. I want to know his honest and real feelings. That's how our father in heaven feels about us. So when we face opposition, when we face adversity, when we're facing obstacles, God invites us to pray, but to pray from the depths of our heart, right? to be real and open and honest with him. And we see this with Nehemiah. So the first response is to pray from the heart. The second is to work with all your heart. In verse six, Nehemiah says, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. So Nehemiah prays, but notice he doesn't just pray and then wait for something to happen. He and the people, they get to work, and they worked with all their heart, right? So even in the midst of opposition, even when it, mean, even when it feels like the world is caving in on them, they continue this good work, continue the great work that God had called them to. Winston Churchill has this great quote that I think illustrates this. He once said, if you're going through hell, keep going. Right? If you're going through a tough time, if you're, if you're in hard times and hard places, but there's something specific that God has called you to, keep going. Keep working. And when it comes to facing opposition and challenges in our spiritual life, I believe that most of us, we lean more towards work or prayer. Right? Prayer or work. There's some of us who we naturally will gravitate towards praying, right? So the obstacles come, we're struggling, so we go to God in prayer. And we, but we don't really do anything. Like we pray and we ask God to help, and then we just, we kind of sit there and we wait for God to come through. Then there's some of us who we gravitate more towards work. So there's an issue, there, there's an obstacle, there's adversity we're facing. So right away, okay, I'm just going to keep my head down and keep working. We're going to figure this out. We're going to plow through with our own strength and our own expertise. And none of those in and of themselves are inherently wrong. But God doesn't call us to prayer or work. He calls us to prayer and work. In fact, the monastics, they have this Latin phrase that they orient their lives around. It's the phrase ora et labora, prayer and work. And that's what Nehemiah and the community reflect. They engage in deep prayer, and then they work with all their hearts. And again, this isn't just an isolated response. This was Nehemiah's pattern. So if we read on, verse 7, so the opposition continues to increase. Like, it, it's just, it's getting worse for them. So when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. So now you have another group that's added, the people of Ashdod. And the geography here is important. So you have Sanballat, who's leading Samaria, which is just north of Israel. And then you have uh, Tobiah and the Ammonites, who are just to the east of Israel. You have Geshem, the Arabs, who are to the south. So now the people of Ashdod are angry. Guess where they're coming from? The West. So Nehemiah literally is facing opposition from all sides, from every direction. And how does he respond? Verse 9, but we prayed. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. So prayer and work, right? We prayed to our God, prayer. We posted a guard, work. Not prayer or work, prayer and work. Ora et labora. Right? So how does Nehemiah respond to opposition? Pray with, from your heart, work with all your heart. Well, from here, the Israelites grow weary. And the haters turn up the heat just a little bit more. So they've, up until this point, they've thrown insults at the Israelites. Uh, they have accused them of treason. Now they're plotting to fight against them. And if you're to read the next few verses, they begin to even plot to kill them. So things are getting bad. Morale is low. And the Israelites say to Nehemiah, look, everywhere we turn, every direction we turn, there's trouble. So this is a, this is a critical leadership moment for Nehemiah. And he calls them to a third response. He's going to call them to fight. 
Verse 13, we read, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall, the places where it was exposed, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. Right? So he's, he's now gathering the people together. He's arming them. He's putting them in strategic places. And then verse 14, After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of their people. Maybe I've just watched too many movies, but when I picture this, he has all the people in front of him. This is like, this is Nehemiah's brave heart moment. The people are weary. They're discouraged. He's gathered them all together. He strategically placed them. And now he's he's got to give that speech to fire them up. And here's what he says. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. He calls them to fight. So in addition to prayer and work, He's calling the, ear, the weary Israelites to fight. Now, I'll be honest, in studying for this, when I think about uh, one of the, the responses being fighting, it makes me a little nervous. Because in my observation, most Christians are pretty good, pretty decent at fighting. But oftentimes, we're fighting for the wrong cause. I mean, what are some of the things, what are some of the fights that we often find ourselves in? Maybe we're fighting for our preferences, fighting for our own comfort, fighting for our power, for our political party or our political view, fighting for our own rights. Maybe we're fighting to win arguments or to prove a point on social media. Has that ever gone well? (laughs) I mean, I've never read like a Facebook post where one person says, hey, I think this. And then the other person chimes in and says, well, you're wrong and you should really see it this way. And then the person's like, oh yeah, you're right. I'll see things your way now, right? Um, Why do we get caught up in these petty little fights? I think oftentimes we get caught up in these petty little fights because we're not engaged in the real fight that God's called us to. Who does Nehemiah say to fight for? He says to fight for your families, for your people, for one another. Ultimately, he's saying, look, fight for the people of God. These were families that God had set apart as his chosen people to be a light to the world, to be a blessing to the nations. He gathered a family and he gave them a mission. Ultimately, Nehemiah was calling the people to fight for the mission that God had given them. It wasn't actually about rebuilding the wall. It was about God rebuilding a Rebuilding a people who would be a witness to his goodness and his love throughout the ends of the earth. So it was about fighting for their identity as a people of God and their vocation, their mission to join God in blessing the world. And so what was Nehemiah's response when he faced opposition? To pray, to work, and to fight. And I actually think we see this ultimately in the life of Jesus. Jesus position all throughout ministry, up until and through the point of his crucifixion and death. And how did Jesus respond? He prayed. He prayed from the heart. The night of his betrayal, the night before his crucifixion, he's in the garden. What was his prayer? Father, take this cup from me. Take this suffering from me. Jesus prayed a real, honest, and raw prayer. He knew what he had to do. But in those moments, he was saying, God, take this from me. Is there another way to do this? I don't want to go through with it. But then he said, not my will, but yours. And he goes to the cross. And as people are hurling insults at him, as people had conspired to kill him, he's on the cross. What is his prayer? It wasn't an imprecatory prayer of judgment. He doesn't pray judgment against his enemies. What does he say? He says, Father, forgive them. Right? Nehemiah prayed, hey, don't show them any mercy. Jesus' prayer was, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus prayed from the heart. Jesus also continued the work that the Father had called him to. Right? Jesus came not to build a wall. He came to build his kingdom, to build a church. And that day in Caesarea Philippi, he looks at Peter and the disciples, and he says, on this rock, I will build what? My church. I'll build my church. He said that the father is always at work 
and I'm at work too. He's joining the Father in the mission that he had given him. Jesus was always at work. He prayed from the heart. He worked with all of his heart. But then Jesus fought the ultimate fight. And it's worth noting that he won. <laughs> that night of his betrayal, when the soldiers come, Peter takes out his sword and he cuts off the ear of a soldier. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, put that sword away. Why? Because Jesus' kingdom was different. Jesus' kingdom wasn't marked by power. It wasn't marked by violence. It was marked by love. It was marked by mercy and forgiveness and peace. And so when he's on trial, he actually says, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus came to usher in a different kingdom. Right? On the cross, Jesus became despised and insulted so that we could be exalted, so that we could be set free. And in doing so, through his death and resurrection, he defeated Satan, sin, and death. And if we place our faith and trust in him, he invites us into the fight. But we'll have victory. We win too. Right? Jesus ultimately is fighting for us. And so when we face opposition, the response that we're called to is to pray. Pray with all of our hearts. Pray with honesty, raw emotion, to work with all our hearts and to fight for the mission that Jesus has given us. And so if God has called you to a great work, you can expect and prepare for great opposition. But Jesus has given us everything that we need for that. So as we close this morning, I want to invite you to prayerfully reflect on a few questions. So you think about this in your own life. You think about maybe what God's calling you to and the opposition you might face and how you might respond. Let me offer you just a few questions to prayerfully reflect upon. Here's the first one. What is the good work that God's calling you to? What's the good work that God's calling you to? Maybe for some of you, it's to grow as a disciple. It's just to, to grow in your experience of following Jesus, to follow him more deeper, to maybe participate more deeply in the mission that he's called you to. Right? Ultimately, Jesus is building you. Maybe for some of you, it's a burden for your children. This whole project for Nehemiah started with a burden. Right? He's in Persia and he hears about what's going on back home and he's burdened by it. Maybe some of you this morning have a burden for your child. I shared that after the first service, someone came up to me and shared a burden that they had for their son. Maybe you want to see your children walking with the Lord Maybe you want to see them discover what God has for them and to follow him passionately. Maybe for some of you, the good work that God's calling you to is to be a light to a coworker, to a neighbor, to a friend, right? Someone who's far from God. And you want to see them come to know Jesus. And you feel that God's calling you to, to be a light in a specific way to them. Maybe for some of you, it's uh, to, to participate in in a ministry of the church. Maybe it's to join a life group. Um, maybe it's to, to serve in ministry. Maybe it's to start a ministry. Maybe for some of you this morning, the good work that God wants to do is he wants to rebuild and restore something in your life. Maybe there's something broken. Maybe God wants to restore a broken relationship that you have, that you gave up on a while ago. Maybe there's that, that secret sin that you continue to deal with and to fight and to battle. And you want freedom in that area. And God's calling you into a season where he wants to heal you from that. What is the good work that God is calling you to? And then the next question is, what opposition or obstacles are you facing? And maybe this morning you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm really not facing any opposition. Well, then let me rephrase that. What opposition will you face? Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Maybe you have some haters you're dealing with. Maybe you have some well-meaning people that are trying to redirect you, but you, you, know God's, you know God's call and it's clear. Maybe for you, it's just the enemies just continues to attack you, continues to attack the growth that God wants to bring about in your life. What opposition are you facing? What opposition might you face? And then the final question, how will you respond? How will you respond? Maybe for some, it's you need to stop fighting out of your own strength. You go to the Lord in prayer. Be real and honest with him. Maybe for some, it's you've been in a season of prayer and God's told you what to do, but you haven't responded. Maybe for you, it's work. 
And then what does it mean to fight for the mission that Jesus has called us to? So I want to give you just a few moments to reflect on those three questions prayerfully. What is the good work, the great work that God is calling you to? What opposition are you facing? And how will you respond? Let's take a few moments and prayerfully reflect on that. And then we'll close in prayer together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the great work that you've called us to. You called us to join you in the ultimate fight, the ultimate mission to rescue and redeem the world. And it's a fight that we know in faith that you've already won. I thank you for the ways that you're calling Hope Church into that mission, into that fight. And yet, Lord, I know that you also have a unique call on each and every person in this room. There's unique ways that you're, you're calling them, that you're wanting to rebuild and restore things in their lives. And so Lord, I pray that whatever that is today, that you would just give each and every person in here courage and strength to follow you, even in the, the face of adversity, whatever that looks like, that they would know that they can come before you in prayer, that they could pray from the depths of their heart, be real and honest about what it is that they're experiencing and the challenges that they face. I pray that you'd give them the strength to to do whatever good work you've called them to. And that they would know, not only do you call them to fight, but that you're fighting for them. Even in this very moment, whatever challenges they're facing, you're fighting for them. Lord, may each and every one of us as we seek to follow you, as we face the obstacles that come, may we remember the words that Nehemiah spoke to the people that day. To not be afraid. To remember the Lord and that you're great and that you're awesome. Lord, I pray that you just speak those words over everyone in this room today. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that you did not leave us alone to face the challenges of life, but that you stand with us, that you lead us, you guide us, and you strengthen us. Thank you for your mercy and your love. Pray that we would just be agents and witnesses to your love, to your rescue and to your salvation, wherever we live, work, and play. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So, God has called you to a great work. You can expect great opposition. But God's also given you whatever you need to face great opposition. So let us remember the Lord that he's great and awesome. Amen. Have a great week.